All right. Um, so the next panel is on communicating across language communities. And we have three panelists today uh, to present. The first is Jonathan Brader. And Jonathan Brader is the Director of Elections from Michigan. Previously, he served as the Legal Policy Director for the Secretary of State's Office and coordinated the Department of State's work on the Secretary's Election Modernization Advisory Committee and Election Security Advisory Commission. He has overseen the implementation of automatic voter registration and online voter registration, among other policy priorities. And we have David Maida. And since 2019, David has served as the Director of Elections for the Minnesota Office of the Secretary of State. Uh, he started in January of 2019. And prior to that, David was the Minnetonka City Clerk for 11 years. He previously served as the election supervisor for Hennepin and Washington counties. And then we have with us Gina Roberts, and Gina is the voter education director for the Citizens Clean Elections Commission. She administers a robust public education program that strives to encourage participation in the political process from voters across the state. Gina is well versed in election policy and administration and her experience includes administering elections for the city of Peoria and serving as the election manager for the Secretary of State. So thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, David, and Gina for being with us today. Uh, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Megan. Um, so uh, I am going to go first. I'm Jonathan Brader. I'm the director of the Michigan Bureau of Elections. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about our, it's on the screen, right? Yes, our experience uh, in Michigan this year um, implementing for the first time uh, translated ballots uh, into Arabic in uh, Dearborn and Hamtramck, Michigan. Um, so this is, uh, I want to be clear, not an expert presentation. Um, I'm very much coming at this from the perspective of a state that has relatively little experience, frankly, in translating ballots and translating election materials um, and, and was going at it uh, sort of for the first time in a new way with some other um, like local jurisdictions that also had pretty limited experience. Um, so I'm going to kind of take you through our experience um, doing this this year, sort of some of the things we learned from it. Um, definitely don't have the perspective of some of the other states that have been doing lots of translations for many years, um, but more kind of how it can work out, even if you're not ready. Um, so just briefly, I got to give the decentralization, you know, just like Megan, I give our are almost as decentralized uh, description in Michigan. So similar to uh, Wisconsin, we have a, a large number of jurisdictions. What's relevant um, for this um, topic, because I'm gonna be talking about ballots, is that the process of uh, doing a new type of ballot, implementing a new ballot policy, does involve all three levels of our election administration. So in this case, it's the city clerks, in this case, in Dearborn and Hamtramck, who are responsible for running elections, um, determining um, how ballots get translated, and, and the resources they need And providing those resources. It's the counties that have the responsibility to actually get those ballots printed and programmed. And then it's the uh, Department of State and the Bureau of Elections uh, that makes sure that we're following the election law and provides general guidance and instructions. So we all needed to work together um, uh, to make this happen. Um, in many ways, the uh, division of responsibilities here was the only reason that we were able to make it work because we had a lot of hands, but it also um, definitely created a lot of questions at the very outset. So that was something that we had to work through. Um, so as I mentioned previously, Michigan is not um, a state that has a very large uh, footprint when it comes to translated election materials. We only have four of our 1,520 municipal jurisdictions that are covered by the language provisions of Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, so I don't know if you can see it on your screen that well, but this is just a snapshot from the, the guidance from DOJ, um, where we have four townships and cities, uh, all of which are relatively small. And the only languages that are covered in Michigan um, are uh, Spanish and uh, Bangla. Um, one of those where we do have Bangla is Hamtramck. So that ended up being helpful here as a point of reference as we were trying to translate into Arabic. Um, but the takeaway here is that we are really are not an experienced actor in this field of translating ballots. Um, and so we didn't have a huge um, frame of reference to compare what we were trying to do to in the past. 
Um, in Michigan specifically, um, the Voting Rights Act coverage formula, Section 203, doesn't necessarily correspond or, uh, or is not necessarily well suited to our language minority populations. Um, the covered languages uh, were developed initially in the 1970s and haven't, I don't think, been updated, at least not substantially since then. And they were language groups that were associated with um, minority groups that had histories of discrimination. Um, in Michigan, although we do have some substantial numbers of limited English proficiency voters, they either don't live in communities where they're necessarily concentrated enough to, to meet the population thresholds of the Voting Rights Act, or in the case of Arabic, it's not a language that is covered um, by Section 203. So, um, you know, Ar Arab Americans are considered white, and Arab is not, or Arabic is not considered a uh, Asian language. So um, both of those are points of dispute. There's definitely disputes about how um, ethnicity and race should be documented in the census and how languages should be classified. But the way that the Census Bureau covers it, um, it doesn't, doesn't apply to Arabic. Um, and, and part of the reason, I mean, I don't know that this would have played out differently, but the experience in Michigan was that although we already had a fairly substantial Arab American population compared to most states in the 1970s, we also experienced a much larger um, influx um, of, of Arab American population starting in the 70s and 80s when there was a lot um, of unrest in the Middle East, obviously the Lebanese Civil War and other global events contributed to us getting a large influx um, of population after the initial um, coverage formula was established. And there obviously have been lots of discussions about whether the coverage formula should be updated, but that's where we are now. Um, so here's a snapshot. I don't know how well you can see it, but um, you know, nationally, um, as, this, as this is American Community Survey data, um, about uh, 2 million out of about 330 million um, Americans are, um, are identified as Arab American. Uh, and that number also is, is a point of dispute. If you look at um, the Arab American Institute, they think the number is substantially higher than that. Um, but according to the American Community Survey, these are the numbers. I also noticed that, that Arab American is, is an ethnicity that some people uh, know that should either be lower or much higher, I think. Um, but that's, that's what people responded to the American Community Survey. Um, but um, uh, in Michigan, I'm just giving you a snapshot here of Dearborn just for comparison, where you know nationally, according to the American Community Survey, it's less than 1%. In Dearborn, it's roughly half. Um, so in Michigan in general, we have the highest concentration of Arab American citizens in the country, and that's definitely true in Dearborn. Um, so Dearborn, just a little bit more. Um, there's there's uh, home of Ford Motor Company, as you can see. Um, it also is um, home to the highest concentration of Arab American citizens in the United States. Um, it has um, the largest mosque in the United States, although it's notable that a, a substantial percentage of Arab Americans in Michigan and in Dearborn are Christian. Um, so uh, we have uh, just a very substantial population there. Um, uh, so this was kind of the, uh, it's been advocated you know, for, for several years to translate more materials uh, into Arabic in Dearborn, um, and some materials have been translated, but, but ballots had not been before. And so this was the first time that there was really a, a, an effort that had some momentum and some funding to make it happen. Um, previously, uh, we had tried uh, in 2020 um, to try to expand uh, translation language accessibility, both in Arabic and other languages. Um, we, were, we did not have uh, ballots uh, like election day voting ballots translated into Arabic or other languages besides the Voting Rights Act languages, but we did provide kind of an expanded language access site that had sample ballots that could be viewed in multiple languages. We also worked to translate more of our materials, voter registration applications, absent voter ballot applications, and some of our informational materials into more languages. Um, and that did help. Um, that, that did have some positive benefits, but it didn't address a lot of the election day problems. So voters um, you know, coming in to cast ballots, although they could have a sample ballot as a reference sheet, that's not the same as having a ballot in, in your preferred language. Um, 
And so, you know, for a lot of voters, it, it just is a barrier to, to access. It's a barrier to understanding and participation. The other thing that it does is it contributes to some of the challenges and conflicts that we face on election day, because it creates situations where um, in Dearborn and other places in Hamtramck as well, you may have situations where a voter wants to have someone come in and help them translate uh, when they're filling out their ballot, which is allowed, but there are restrictions on who can assist you uh, with voting. So it you know, can't be your employer and other things like that. So that can sometimes put, um, that, that can sometimes put the uh, election workers, poll workers in an awkward situation to you know, make sure that the person's able to get assistance, but also make sure that the limitations on who can come in and assist um, are being followed. So uh, definitely didn't fill all the needs. So um, in 2022, um, we did get a resolution to uh, have ballots translated into Arabic. It happened pretty late. <laughs> um, so it, it happened, you know, and it happened relatively quickly where on March 23rd, uh, of this year, uh, the city council passed a resolution uh, calling for ballots to be translated uh, into Arabic. Um, that gave us very little time to, to act. Um, as you can see, just from the timeline here, based on our calendar, we start printing ballots on June 3rd, and then they need to be available to be mailed out a couple weeks after that in advance of our August 2nd election. So really, between the time this was announced and the time ballots had to be available, there was very little time, which obviously um, makes election officials uh, very nervous. Um, and so it wasn't immediately clear after this resolution was passed that uh, it was going to actually be possible to do this ballot translation. Um, so so uh, we kind of immediately sprung into action um, and started discussing um, with, with the jurisdictions uh, what would actually be required to make this happen. So as, basically, as soon as the, um, the resolution was passed, um, you know, clerks get, started getting questions. The Wayne County clerk, uh, which is the county in which Dearborn is located, uh, was getting questions about you know, how ballot translation would work. The Dearborn city clerk as well. We were getting questions about it. Um, so one of the first things we had to do was huddle everyone up from the election administration side and just explain to them the legal situation we were in um, it was kind of a new thing, or it very much was a new thing to be translating ballots into a language that wasn't specifically required by the Voting Rights Act. So the immediate reaction from some was like, can we even do this? Because, you know, the vote, like in Wayne County, the Voting Rights Act tells us to do ballots in Bangla in Hamtramck, and that's, that's what we've always done. And the Voting Rights Act doesn't say anything about Arabic, so can we do this? So one of the things that we had to do quickly was just verify that it was fine to go above and beyond the minimum requirements of federal law in translating ballots. Um, and so you know, we, we had to uh, go through that process relatively quickly, assure everyone that, that we were allowed to do this. The other thing that we had to do was just kind of help manage some of the public communications because obviously, you know, as was discussed in the prior panel, um, folks don't understand how the election process works. So people see news headline, Arabic ballots in Dearborn, they just assume that that's what's gonna happen. And so we had to explain to the public and to the media that there was a lot to go into this, that everyone wanted to make it happen, but we were gonna have to work closely and carefully with Wayne County and Dearborn and also the voting system vendors to make sure that we were able to actually do this. Um, so the other, the other issue that, that often comes up here is funding. I mean, that's probably the primary obstacle to doing this in most cases is just, you know, expanding the cost of printing more ballots, translating ballots, um, the extra time needed for programming and printing, um, and just who's going to pay for that. In this case, um, the city was very clear that they were going to fund this. So, so we sorted that out very quickly, and, and with those resources available, um, you know, we knew that we had the... Um, the resources to make it happen as long as we had the time. And then the logistics, we had to sort out kind of who was doing what, when. We established a schedule to meet um, where we would have the vendor and the city and the county on um, talking about who was going to um, make sure that the ballots, you know, but that a translator was identified, that the programming would work, that the ballot could be tested. Um, so, so we had to kind of basically rely on the process that we use for Bangla and Hamtramck and adapt that to a different language in a different city, um, but, but basically figure that all out immediately. Um, so we sort of sorted out in our state um, who had to do what, 
Um, it was clear, you know, we made clear that the city had to hire a translator. Um, the county uh, was going to arrange to send the ballot proofs to get translated. Um, we had to verify, you know, the dialect. Uh, it was pretty obvious that it was modern standard Arabic, but just verify that, make sure everyone agreed. Um, you know, Arabic is a right to left language, so making sure that that didn't cause layout problems. Um, the, the biggest thing was probably, or one of the biggest things, was not the ballots themselves, but the programming of the ballot marking device audio files. So there's thousands of files that needed to be translated. So um, that was actually probably ultimately the biggest undertaking, um, but just making sure that translators were available to translate the spoken um, content um, from English into Arabic so that voters with disabilities or others who wanted to use the ballot marking device were able to hear the prompts um, in Arabic. Um, and then another thing that was really critical here was um, uh, I, making sure that there was sufficient community input and review. So uh, the, the first translations that came back um, were not good. <laughs> so, and, and we see that often regardless of language when we get things translated is that our, our translators don't always do the best job in the first round. So we, we were having regular communications with the city to make sure they were reaching out to their community members and leaders and they had basically a board um, that was a rapid response review board and could look at those translations basically the same day, turn them around, get them corrected. And, and that was something that you know ideally you'd have much more time for, but that everybody, because we had a lot of buy-in from the cities and the communities, were able to, um, to get that done. And, and again, it was helpful to just sort of have the process that was used um, for Bangla and Hamtramck as a, as a touch point, basically, for how we did all this. Um, meanwhile, uh, Hamtramck, which also has a substantial um, uh, Arabic-speaking population, shortly after Dearborn um, decided to do this, they, they decided to do it as well. So their city council also acted. What you're looking at here is a map. The purple there is the city of Detroit. Um, south of there is actually Canada, FYI. A lot of people get confused by that, but that's Canada down there. Um, those two non-purple spaces in the middle are the cities of Highland Park and Hamtramck, which are two cities that are actually entirely surrounded by Detroit. Um, so that creates a lot of fun election issues for us in terms of, of geography. Um, but Hamtramck is, uh, has a very interesting history. Um, people with lots of different national origins there over the years. Um, and again, already covered by 203 with regard to, to Bangla. Um, it was actually really helpful to have a second city involved in this. Um, one, because Hamtramck had kind of had the experience already doing it with Bangla. And then also um, having two cities working on this at the same time helped us learn different things more quickly and share knowledge more quickly across the cities. Um, so that was actually, I think, a really key um, component here to having this be successful in both cities. Um, was having um, Hamtramck get involved as well. Um, so ultimately, it did work. <laughs> uh, we were able to get everything translated uh, in time. Ballots went out um, basically on time. Um, it, it was uh, the, one, of the, one of the headlines here on the right was sort of saying it was like a last minute effort. And the framing of the article was sort of like, oh, well, they did this all at the last minute, um, which, yes, we did. But that's because it was only approved on March 23rd. Um, and so, you know, it was a relief because, um, you know, we all embarked on this wanting to get it done at the state level, at the city level, at the county level, but being very nervous about this timeline. And there was a re real possibility when we first started that we weren't going to be able to get it done in time for August. Um, but, it, it, but it did work due to a lot of extra hours and a lot, a lot of positive co uh, conversations at all levels. And it was really gratifying to see it go into effect. You could see just some, from some of the voters being interviewed, how much it meant to them to have uh, ballots in their preferred language. Um, I think it was, uh, and it's gonna be ultimately, I think, helpful in the long term, building um, community engagement. I think having people vote more regularly, um, having that experience with a ballot, um, you know, not only will have them more engaged directly in the election process in terms of voting, but also make it easier to, you know, share election information, help combat uh, misinformation and disinformation. Um, so just in terms of you know, getting them to be regular voters and more engaged, that's really helpful. And you know, I mean, I can only imagine, I mean, I, I personally sometimes, you know, I'm very confident I open up my absent voter ballot envelope and you know, I know how to vote. 
I'm the director of elections. And then I see the, um, the ballot proposals on there and then I have to look that up and I'm, how do I wanna go on that one? So I can only imagine how hard that is um, uh, if, if it's not your preferred language. And so especially for things like that and the instructions, having a higher percentage of our voters be able to engage in that in their preferred language, um, uh, definitely meaningful over the long term. Um, so, you know, the big takeaways were certainly wouldn't recommend doing this on this timetable, um, but, but it is possible, like even not really knowing what we were doing um, and not having much time um, with the will and kind of the, the willingness to, to push through some of the snags, it was able um, to be accomplished. Um, having more lead time would definitely reduce some of the riskiness of this enterprise in terms of getting it done in this timeline. It also would have probably allowed us to do more one of the things that was not ideal was that because there was so little time, there wasn't time to get the absent voter ballot applications perfectly set up so that people could easily request, you know, you know indicate on there, oh, I want a ballot in Arabic. So, you know, it might have been the case that somebody was filling out an application in English, they wanted a ballot in Arabic, or it might have been the opposite. They might have wanted to fill out an Arabic application, but get an English ballot. And just looking at some of the other election day materials that we wanted to translate, we had to kind of pick and choose which ones we could translate in the time we had. So having a two year cycle to implement this or at least a year as opposed to a couple of weeks definitely would have been better. So um, for other communities looking at this, um, while having the community buy-in is critical, um, definitely having a little more lead time and a little more um, awareness of the election calendar would have been useful. But ultimately, even with all those caveats, um, it was a successful effort. And even if you don't really know what you're doing, um, you, can, you can make meaningful access improvements. Thank you, Jonathan. So I should begin by thanking Amy for including me on this panel because 99% of this work was done by other people in the office and I love taking credit for what other people do. Um, no, but I'm, I'm really proud of the, our office's efforts in translating voter, voting material into history and we'll get into that in my presentation here. Um, so I am certainly no expert on the Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. For the first time in our state's history, we have a jurisdiction that falls under its threshold of 5%, and that is the city of St. Paul with our Hmong community. And so we, I've, um, everything I know about the Section 203 I learned when I went through the election center election administ administration certification program in the early 2000s. And I remember there was a session at that time on Section 203. And the only thing I remember taking away from that session is I'm glad Minnesota doesn't fall under this because this seems like an awful lot of, a lot of work. And so he here we are 20 years later and we do indeed have, um, it's Ramsey County, which contains the city of St. Paul, which does have a large Hmong population. I happen to live in the city of St. Paul. And so I've seen the change in the city over the past 20 years, and it's been wonderful. I'm a third generation Japanese American. To see so many Hmong Americans come to our city and transform it has been just really inspiring. If you visit me at the state capitol, most of the businesses, the restaurants around the state capitol are small. Um, family-owned Hmong businesses. If you go to any of our, our farmers markets in the Twin Cities area, you'll always see Hmong farmers at the farmers markets. They've added so much to our community. Um, I live by one of the largest city parks in our state, um, and every July 4th weekend, the Hmong have a nationwide festival where tens of thousands of Hmong Americans from across the country come and have a huge festival for the 4th of July weekend. It's really cool They have this sport, I don't know what it's called, but it's a combination between hacky sack and volleyball where they're kicking the thing over their head over the net. It's amazing to watch. The food's great, but I have to say the best thing about it, it well, there are two really good things about it. First of all, I don't have the opportunity in Minnesota often to be among crowds of Asian Americans. So it's a very unique experience for me personally, but the better thing is I'm average size in the crowd or I lean taller. And that's the only time in my life I've been able to say that. Um, so again, when we f found out that we fell under the requirements of section 203 in this, primarily the city of St. Paul, I immediately re reached out to Ramsey County, which runs St. Paul's elections. They have a contractual um, arrangement to do so. 
and we immediately met with the DOJ to see what we had to do. Since our office had already translated a lot of things into the Hmong language, including polling place posters, the voter registration application, the voter um, absentee application, some of the work was done. The big challenge was for Ramsey County to do the ballots, as Jonathan went through in his presentation. And um, Ramsey County happens to use Hart Inner Civics voting equipment. And Hart actually does have a version of their system. I think they use it in California that could help with it, um, creating and reading the Hmong ballot. We don't, we, in Minnesota, we haven't certified that version of the software yet. So unfortunately, it's not an option. Ramsey County has worked with Hart to come up with something. Um, I think it's really important to contextualize what I'm presenting today because translations are not new, certainly are not new in Minnesota. In Minnesota, we've translated election materials since 1896. Um, back then, the language, languages we were translating for voters are Swedish, Norwegian, and German. If you visit our state, you'll understand why it's really the culture of the state, including our football team, comes from these communities. Obviously, things have evolved, and um, the top three languages today in our state are Somali, Spanish, and Hmong. One of the things unique about Minnesota government is we, I think, are the only state that has three statutorily created ethnic councils. So there's a council on Latino affairs, a council of Minnesota, Minnesotans of African heritage, and the council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. These three state agencies, they're, they're, by statute, they have basically two different duties. One is to advise the governor and the legislature on issues that are unique to the um, constituents of those particular councils. And then the other one is really important. It, they're supposed to provide a bridge between members of the communities and state government. They provide some connection between local government and members of the community. And then over the past few years, there was more effort to help members of the community with, federal, with the federal government, primarily in the immigration area. Um, in 2014, I was fortunate enough to be appointed by the governor to serve on the Council of Asian Pacific Minnesotans. My term actually ended last month. There's, two, there's a term limit of two four-year terms. I hit my term limit in June. Um, I, I'll mention this because this has really been a resource for our Office of the Secretary of State to use to use the services provided by these three councils to make relationships with members of leaders in the community. And certainly in the translation of voting materials, these three state agencies have been vital in providing a connection between our office and members of the community. I will say prior to taking this job, I, I was a chair of the board of the Council of Asian Pacific Minnesotans for mo mo most of my term. And prior to taking this position, it was always kind of I had to wear two different hats. It's almost like a full, two full-time jobs because a lot of the work as the chair was to go to the legislature and testify on issues and meet legislators to educate them on some of the things going on in the Minnesota Asian community. Um, so I always made sure I didn't do that on the city dime when I was with the city of Minnetonka. Um, it's been a little bit less easy to wear separate hats because the same legislative committees that control the Secretary of State's budget, control the Council of Asian Pacific Minnesotans budget. So I, I blurred lines and if you're a Seinfeld fan, I don't like to mix what was George's thing. Anyways, I, I, oh, I should back up. One of the things I was gonna mention, the bio I that Megan read, I provided, is the one I provide to Minnesota groups I speak before, and you, probably none of you know what any of those jurisdictions I work for are, but Hennepin County is a, uh, the state's largest registered voter county. It contains the city of Mi Minneapolis. Um, the city of Minnetonka, where I spent much of my career, if you've heard of Minnetonka, it's likely from per Prince's Purple Rain movie where there was a scene around Lake Minnetonka. Um, so it's a suburb west of um, Minneapolis. So again, what was the impetus for us really to go be beyond the three languages that we have been translating, the Hmong, Somali, and Spanish? In 2016, um, Secretary of State Simon really was the impetus. Se Secretary of State Simon's mother is an immigrant, and she, although she speaks English, she always found it easier to read written material in her native language. So um, he's really 
dug into why we we're only doing three. Why don't we provide more translated materials? And he was really the, put, uh, the push behind this effort. And at the same time, we had a voter outreach director at, who ran with it, who really made it um, his mission for 2016 to get more language translated. His name's Jeff Narrowbrook. He's now a um, election administrator for the city of Minneapolis. So again, I, sh I don't deserve credit for any of the work that's been done here at Secretary Simon working with our out former outreach director that really did the bulk of the work. And so in 2016, Jeff worked with um, the three ethnic councils I mentioned with other leaders in the community to determine things that would be useful. And in 2016, things that got translated into 10 different languages were web pages with important election dates, who can vote, how to register to vote, our same day registration requirements, how to vote early in person or by mail, absentee instructions, how to track the status of an absentee ballot and then voting location and hours and what's on a ballot. We don't do ballot translations in Minnesota. We're obviously under 203, we now have to do the Hmong ballot, but um, we provide a page on our website that actually shows the candidates are in the, and any precinct ballot in Minnesota, um, those pages are translated. And then we also started offering printable fact sheets with voter information, including information about rights voters have in Minnesota, like protected time off work to vote. And then at, since that time, every time we come up with new material, we make sure we translate it into as many languages as we can. These are the 10 languages we currently are translating voter information in. Americ, Chinese, Hmong, Khmer, Lao, Oromo, Russian, Somali, Spanish, and Vietnamese. They are chosen based on the census data on eligible voters in Minnesota. And we continue to update the information on our translated websites for each language that can be found on mnvotes.gov. In 2020, one of the things our outreach director really pointed out, and I think Jonathan might have mentioned it, but Gail mentioned it in her presentation this morning, is some of the languages really, the, the um, members of that particular ethnicity don't necessarily get information by reading it. They, in, they, they get their information more from um, spoken word and so in 2020 one of the things we did was to try to create videos in the different languages um, to reach more members of the communities and we we're going to continue that, that effort it was really one of the things our outreach director at the time thought was critical and i know gina is going to do a lot with the american sign language but um we did some work in this area in 2020 as well. We, for the first time, our state offered accessible absentee ballots um, for those with print disabilities. Um, we also used, did a, a series of video fact sheets in American Sign Language. We produced those in collaboration with another state agency called the Minnesota Commission of the Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. We did videos basically providing information on voters' rights, assistance that voters can ask for, voting early by absentee voting and then election day registration. We also provided a hotline in American Sign Language the 10 days prior to the election with help with the Minnesota Commission of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. And so what are some of the lessons we learned? Um, one of the lessons I learned personally came in speaking with the executive director of the Council of Asian Pacific Minnesotans. When I talked to her name, Sia, her, and when I talked to Sia, she reminded me that some of the newer refugee communities coming to Minnesota were coming from very oppressive governments that had no, they, they didn't have terms translatable on some of the things we take for granted in running our elections in a democracy. And so some of the work that we are looking at translating into some of the other languages, we really have to take that into account. It's not a word by word translation, it's a meaning by meaning translation. Um, we have to know where our own blind spots are. So it was really critical to engage actual community members. One of the things I did I th um, when Ramsey County came to me um, for meetings on their requirements under Section 203, I immediately put them in touch with the Council of Asian Pacific Minnesotans who has really good 
contacts with who are the leaders in the community, how can we get information that this new resource is available to me the members of the Hmong community. And so it's really important to engage with community members. They give you good advice that needs to be listened to. And then one other um, kind of thing that came up in 2020 is we were translating something having to do with absentee voting into the Hmong language for an ad, radio ad we were gonna run. And what we learned when the trans, the, the narrator came in to read the script, he didn't know how to read the script. Because, and we thought, what's going on here? And again, it was because we had, uh, we were lucky that one of my development team is Hmong American. We presented it to him and he said, yes, this is written in very old language. So it's like old Shakespearean Hmong language that no young kid would know. And so we really worked to make sure that what the, even our spoken word that we were translating things into the, um, in, in, in ways that those speaking that language would understand the message we were trying to deliver. And it's really important, and this is a lesson I've learned hard this year, it's really important to budget for these things if you're gonna do them, as Jonathan mentioned, far in advance if you know you're gonna be doing this because it takes a long time. And the resources, some of them are um, like, and it should have been obvious to me, but when we were, what, one of the first steps we took this year was to make sure that as we were translating, you know, get to what we're actually trying to translate this year, our online voter registration our application, our um, voter registration lookup, our poll finder, our absentee application, and then the absentee ballot tracker. As we're translating these into the 10 languages, the first thing we did was to make sure we were using plain English on the English versions because you don't want a lot of jargon that gets translated and probably will get translated in a goofy way. And so we really worked hard on making sure that the English versions were using plain language, but that took a lot of time to go through each application to make sure um, things read well before we translated it. But one of the things that didn't occur to me until one of our IT staff pointed out, uh, and I should have known this obviously, but some languages obviously you don't read really left to right, you read vertically. And so that presented a challenge, particularly on the different applications where we're asking voters to provide information that is going to be used by the counties. And finally, I think I'll touch on, um, so in 2021, two of my team, the ones that were primarily responsible for answering the public phones and the e public emails came to me, they got new jobs, so they were leaving the office and I did exit interviews with both of them. And the message they had to me was we needed a better nexus in 2020 between the voter outreach team and the, the elections administration side of, of the team. And because they saw right away in 2020 that the phone calls that they typically get about processes, how do I register to vote? How do I cast apps to application? They weren't getting as many of those. They were getting what were messages that were the found, um, beginnings of com, um, conspiracy theories where people are really questioning the integrity of the voter registration system, our voting equipment, um, whether or not they could use a Sharpie, that came up later. but. Um, so it really dawned on me as I as we move forward into 2022, I really needed to be more have we needed a better connection between what the elections team was hearing and what our outreach team, which falls under our communication staff, um, was producing. And so we've been meeting on a regular basis, weekly basis, and we are starting to develop. Um, we're doing webinars. Um, bi-monthly, and then we are producing short videos um, to kind of pr provide accurate information about how our election systems are secure and accurate. And it, it has occurred to me in doing this work that um, there's really different missions of the election side versus the outreach side. The outreach side really are trying to get all Minnesotans to participate in our elections process so we can maintain we can continue to be ahead of Judd in Colorado and vo voter turnout. That's kind of their mission. But our election team is more explaining our processes and our laws to the voters, to candidates, to our counties. And so there's some crossover, but it's kind of two different missions. But doing this work with our outreach folk is really, this is our first attempt at really thinking about how are we going to reach um, the members of the communities that our outreach team typically 
reach it, reaches out to the, the underrepresented voters in, of Minnesota, including those that speak English as a second language or don't speak English at all. And it's really, we're going, we're go, going ahead. The reason we're doing these webinars is we're doing them for our outreach partners. And the reason we chose to do that is we're tr trying to take this as a teach the teacher moment. They're obviously probably hearing from members of their communities on some of these, this misinformation, disinformation, and to provide them the information on how to actually answer questions that they're getting from their community members on the integrity of our elections. That's my contact information and my good friend, the Dalai Lama and myself. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Gina, and I'm with the Arizona Citizens Clean Elections Commission. And uh, just coming from Arizona, I'm sorry about the Sharpie thing. Um, <laughs> but I'm very excited to speak with all of you about American Sign Language today. We are, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on clean elections because we're not your typical agency. Um, we were actually created by voters in 1998 through a citizens initiative. And our primary focus is to provide voter education and outreach uh, so voters have all the information that they need to cast a vote. Um, and I will say that when it comes to voter education, historically, it's typically been about, you know, providing people information on registering to vote, how to get your ballot, the logistics of voting, right? But as we've seen with mis, dis, and malinformation, it's now extended to how is my ballot kept secure? You know, how are ballots tabulated? So with that um, in increase in what we are educating the public on, it also comes to the information that we are also translating as well. So with that said, I wanted to provide some context on what our biggest piece of um, election information is that we provide directly to voters. So our agency is tasked with creating a voter education guide, and we send this guide to every single household in the state with a registered voter. Um, the introduction has, again, those logistical key points, such as you know, what ID is acceptable at the polls, uh, how independents can participate in our primary system, uh, county contact information, how to get my ballot, all of that stuff. Um, in addition to that, we also provide information on the candidates that are running at the state and legislative level. So our voter guide has a profile for all of those candidates that qualified for the ballot. It includes their picture, their website information, their uh, political affiliation, and a 200-word statement directly um, from the candidate. So in 2020, 22 for our primary right now, uh, we had 232 statewide and legislative candidates. And we just sent out about 2.3 million pieces to our voters. We have 30 legislative districts in Arizona. So we translate this guide um, and we send it out automatically in English and Spanish. We also produce the large print version and Section 203 for Arizona, our jurisdictions, some of our jurisdictions are covered with Native American languages and also Spanish. And so we also translated the voter guide into Navajo and Apache languages. Um, we have a plain text version for our website, so it's accessible for screen readers. Uh, we partner with a local organization called Sun Sounds of Arizona, which actually reads the guide aloud. And then in addition to that, uh, in starting in 2020, we began producing the voter guide in American Sign Language. And I'll talk about what that process looked like for us. So this guide is going to households across the state, and it's also going to libraries, schools, community centers, um, chapter houses that are on tribal land. So it's a very well-known piece of voter education material in the state of Arizona. This is uh, what the guide looks like, just again, providing context here so you can see what those statements look like. And we too in Arizona have a commission uh, that is dedicated to providing services for the deaf and the hard of hearing community. And so their purpose is really to make sure that information is accessible to these voters to improve their quality of life. Well, that includes participating in our democratic process, right? So this includes voting. Um, so with that said, with knowing that we have this voter guide, knowing that we have ACDHH, um, let's talk about what American Sign Language actually is. And I'll start by saying what it's not. It is not written English. And there is a major misconception um, that we often hear about, well, why is ASL even necessary when it's a printed guide? They could just read it. It is not um, written English. And so written English is definitely not a substitute for ASL. It's actually a natural language where um, they basically, their grammar is different. And so the way that they are signing words, it's different. 
Um, it's very visual language. And it's, um, you know, when we talk about translating and interpreting the meanings of some of our words, especially if it's election terminology, um, that, that can be difficult oftentimes. So it's actually a very beautiful language as well, too. And, and just looking at the behind the scenes that I'll share with you in a little bit, um, this was actually a very emotional project, too, to conduct the translation. And in Arizona specifically, uh, we have more than 1.1 million Arizonans who are deaf or hard of hearing. And so I've got a quote here from the executive director from ACBHH, and this is, you know, you're right here, we're showing why they wanted to participate in this project with us, uh, because now that they can provide this information to voters in their native language, um, which I think that's the common theme you're hearing about how important it is to provide voter education, voting information to voters in their preferred language. So, that's a little bit about Arizona, but just looking across the country uh, about why this could be important potentially to your community is approximately 15% of American adults um, report some trouble uh, with, with hearing, and one in eight people in the United States, age 12 years and older, they have hearing loss in both ears. And so I thought that was actually a pretty fascinating um, stat. And also, again, about 28.8 million US adults could benefit from using hearing aids. So. Arizona, we have about 4.3 million registered voters. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, over 1.1 million Arizonans are hard of hearing. So, you know, that's not directly equated to the voter registration numbers, but it shows a significant portion of our community um, is deaf or hard of hearing and could benefit from additional resources. So I was able to find this information from the EAC and Rutgers, and I thought um, it was a pretty interesting stat when we looked at um, disability and voter turnout in the 2020 elections. So of the voting eligible population that reported voting, 68% um, that reported vo voting reported also having a hearing impairment. So again, just to provide some context in terms of the community that we're looking at here. So how did we end up collaborating with the Arizona Commission for the Deaf and Party of Hearing to provide voter education materials in American Sign Language? It was actually a very natural, organic um, uh, start in that um, their, one of their directors uh, worked with me at the Secretary of State's office. So it, it benefited from a relationship that we already had with the community. Um, and once you know we started talking, we, we really felt, hey, there's a great opportunity for our, our agencies to collaborate here and provide this service to Arizona voters. So we first started working with them um, in early 2020 to produce voter education materials regarding voter registration, our upcoming presidential preference election, and how to vote. And so basically, we wrote the script for um, the information that needed to be conveyed to voters, and then they internally with their team created the American Sign Language videos. We ended up sharing those on our social media, on our website, so we helped distribute it to the community. So that was sort of the kickoff of our partnership. Then we decided, okay, what other opportunities can we do here to provide American Sign Language out to voters? So we ended up creating uh, short social media videos that are really just uh, the key dates um, for, you know, such as voter registration deadline or early voting begins. And uh, I'll play one of those for you here. So it doesn't look like we have the audio for that. There's audio that comes with it. So in addition to these short social videos, we also have a voter education video series that we developed where we talked about safeguarding our elections, everything from you know, election equipment is air-gapped to this is how ballot tabulation occurs, uh, bipartisan boards, you know, chain of custody. So then we have how to find official election information, you know, going to your trusted sources, going to the Secretary of State's office, going to the counties. Uh, we talked about the ballot by mail system in Arizona. We talked about the different levels of government, so again, it's not just the logistics of voting, but talking about the different levels of government so voters understand what's on their ballot, why they may care about a particular office and what those roles and responsibilities are so they can feel that greater connection to the election. And then of course, registering to vote and uh, happy election day, which is kind of like you know voting 101, what to expect at the polls. So we'll see if we can get maybe one of those to play too. Well, it doesn't look like we have the audio. There's audio, but... Um, you can see the movements. These are what we call in picture. So the, the signer is in picture with the rest of the video. We do have the voiceover, which is occurring 
um, and then they are captioned as well. So for it to be fully... Um, Oftentimes, people will turn to Google to perfect. look up voting information, but search engines themselves... There we go. So, so when you're producing American Sign Language, you have your um, Deaf Talent Designer, you have your interpreter, and that would be the person speaking, the voiceover, and then you also have to have captions. So having th those three components is what makes um, American Sign Language fully accessible for the deaf and the hard of hearing community. And so here's an example of the translation for one of the districts in our voter guide. Again, just to give you an idea of what it looks like for us here. Candidates for State Senator, District 4. Nancy Bartow, party, Republican. Campaign funding, traditional. Website, nancybartow.com forward slash. As your senator. So I'm interested in knowing your reaction to that video and if you felt that if you felt those pauses. Was that a little slow for you maybe? And the reason why I ask is because there are pauses in there. And so I think you know, taking into consideration the time it takes to produce American Sign Language, it is very time intensive. Um, you know, there's pauses there. We have to match up the voiceover to the movements of the signer. So some of the process considerations, again, I talked about this a little bit already, but who is actually participating in this project? So you have your talent which is going to be the signer, the, the, um, the deaf talent. And then you have your CDI, your certified deaf interpreter. This is the person who is interpreting what this person is signing. And so that's, that serves as the voiceover. And then of course we have the caption process too. So the other thing that you need to consider if you're going to be undertaking this is your script. We've heard before, make sure that we're talking in plainly English here, right? That way when we come to interpreting, it's easier on the interpreter. So they don't have to try to interpret something that is a, you know, severely technical term. Um, if throughout this process, always make sure that you have an election official within your office during this translation process, because they need to be available if the signer has questions on, okay, well, what is the meaning or the intent of this word here? Um, and then how are you going to produce it? So we've heard a lot uh, on some of the other panels about creating voter education videos. You know, are we using an iPhone here? Are we using Zoom? Are we, you know, doing it in person? Will we, will we be editing these videos? Those all need to go into consideration. And then your timeline. Um, I think that's another common theme here is time is so important. This was such a time in intensive project for us. So just for the production of our 2022 primary voter guide, um, we had seven statewide offices, our introduction, we had 30 legislative districts. So this really came out to about 50,000 words in written English that we needed to translate. And it took us a full week um, and it was exhausting. It was a, it, every day, Monday through Friday with very minimal breaks. Um, but with that said, we have to defer to our talent and to the CDIs because they have certain rules that they have to follow where they can only go so long without a break. Um, and then, you know, the costs for it too. We were grateful that we were able to partner with ACDHH in the production, but also the cost. So in 2020, for both our primary and our general election, which resulted in 60 plus videos, we spent, for our agency, about $33,000. But I would say that is on the high end of what this should cost because we have a very healthy budget when it comes to producing materials like this. It does not need to cost that much. As I said, as long as you have maybe a Zoom account um, and you can work with some community-based organizations or the disability communities um, and get access to that talent, then I think you can do it for a very reasonable amount um, for hard costs. But again, timing is something else. Do you have the staff available to do this? So <clears throat> some of the lessons that we learned, we need more time. <laughs> you know, we'll go through that again and again. Uh, you know, as we plan out from election, you know, E minus 90 days, E minus 120 days, um, make sure you have a good idea of when you are going to be doing this and whatever time that you need after for editing. But also it takes time to secure the talent. It takes time to secure those uh, certified um, deaf interpreters and the talent. And then a pronunciation guide as well. So how do we pronounce some of these candidate names? We had to produce a, a guide for the uh, voiceover. Uh, we needed additional pre-production meetings so we could understand kind of the run of show of these things. And then also even just protocols too. So we did this on Zoom. 
which there were probably about 12 of us on Zoom, and several of the people that were on there were deaf and hard of hearing, which means that we can't just talk over one another. We had to be very specific and raise our hand when we wanted to speak and be called on. So it was very structured in how we communicated with these folks. And then distribution, how are we getting this out to the community? So we put it on our website, we put it out on social media, we shared it with the candidates because the candidates now have a tool that they could utilize to communicate with the voters in their district who are deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, you know, we shared it with the press. And so just continuing to push this information out there, uh, again, it's still very new for us. We started this in 2020. So we're very excited to continue to offer this to voters. And we have made that commitment. We have publicly committed that going forward, we will continue to provide our voter education guide in American Sign Language. So with that, I wanted to share this short clip with you about some media coverage that we were able to get. And before we play it, in 2020, we were very lucky where when we decided to kick this off, um, if you remember Sesame Street, Linda the Librarian, she is actually a registered Arizona voter. So we were very lucky that she decided to come on. We hired her as a coach to help kind of keep all of our talent um, uh, consistent with how they were signing things. And so it was very wonderful to work with Linda on this opportunity. And we can go ahead and play that clip. With the interview, Linda, I have to tell you, as the mother of a deaf child, I have to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You have for many years been a strong advocate for the deaf, uh, deaf and hard of hearing community. So thank you so much. And on that note, let me ask you, why do you feel it's so important to provide American Sign Language version of the voter guide? Uh, it is very, very important to me because us as members of the deaf community, we want to be able to um, be involved in our democracy. We have the right to vote. And for us, voting means that we have to have access to the information and most everything is in written form. And so for us to put that into their visual language, American Sign Language, is a very, very exciting time in our community and in our lives. The accessibility in ASL is really incredible. It is their primary language. So we really, really are enjoying and cherish our rights to vote. And so with this being the record first time, we're setting a precedent and we are very, very excited about it. And really, we want to applaud the CCEC for partnering with the Arizona Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, ACDHH, to make this happen. It has been a wonderful partnership. It is exciting. So the reason why... With the interview, Linda... Oh. Sorry. The reason why I chose that clip, we actually were very grateful and, and uh, lucky that we had a lot of media coverage on this. But the reason why I chose that clip is because if you'll recall at the beginning, the reporter started by saying she has a child who is deaf and hard of hearing. And so I thought that was really touching because it just goes to show you how many people we really are reaching um, and how important and what this means to the community. Um, I can tell you, again, just my own personal experience after coming off of this, it, it was a very emotional time going through that translation process because when we talk about language, I don't think American Sign Language is often considered a language in its own right, but then also when we look at how it originated and it's often associated with a disability, it has, you know, that just adds to the meaning of it to the community. And so, um, again, very, uh, we all had all the feels. So it, it was a really fun and worthwhile and meaningful project. And we've been grateful with how people have responded to it. This primary, our candidates have already been like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And then I had a candidate ask, why did you do this if it's printed? So there's also opportunities for education there. Uh, and they were happy with the response there too. So um, we continue to look forward to providing American Sign Language for, for our voters in our community. So thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I think we might have time for a question. Um, oh, please. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely interested in the, um, I th I'll, I'll leave it to one question. So, because one of the questions I had was, I, you know, putting translations on your website how, and translating documents, how do you keep up with it? Because that's kind of the challenge that we have anytime we change something on the website. Do we go through an entirely new translation? Um, and then uh, kind of a second part of the question is, and when you are doing translations, 
for the um, uh, the candidate names? Do you do transliteration for candidate names in the um, in the other languages that have a non-traditional alphabet? I'm assuming that's for me. Um, so. Um... To your first question, yeah, we are very deliberative on what we are translating. Given your point, if it's going to change tomorrow, it's going to take time to do that. So th th the information that we have translated tends to lend itself to pr procedures that would take a legislative change. And so things that don't typically change over time. One of the things I really r wrestled with is we, we followed many of you in this room's lead on creating a page on our website based on fighting the disinformation. And obviously, we're not, the idea behind that is when we hear the latest misinformation, disinformation, we're going to add that to the that page on the website. Obviously, it would really be nice to be able to translate that website page, but we can't do that. So we do take the deliver. <coughs> A deliberate approach to what we're actually translating. Is, is, in your question about candidate names, no, we are not doing that at this point. Well, thank you all so very much. Sorry we don't have time for more questions, but really appreciate that presentation. So thank you all very much.